Okay, hello. Uh, I'm trying to be on time. Um, hi, my name is Cedric. Uh, today I'm going to talk about becoming data driven, and I actually have a lot of material to cover. So I have to, I have to talk very. Oh. <laughs> this is like an alumni gathering for any attackers. Um, okay, so, so I, I actually do have a lot of material to cover, um, and I don't want to waste your time. So I'll just get started. Uh, basically, yes, I, I did start NUS Hackers and all that, but uh, this actually started, this entire journey started because I wrote a, about two years ago, um, these two people, Colin Breyer and Bill Carr, who were very early Amazon. Uh, I think Colin joined in around 97, 96 or 97, I can't remember. Uh, I think it's 97, two years after Amazon was started. And Bill Carr, and both of them were eventually S team members. S team is the highest level, the executive team of Amazon. It used to be called J team, and then now I think it's S, S team is senior team. Ah, this. Um, and uh, they wrote this book called Working Backwards. And working, what Working Backwards was supposed to be was to document six mechanisms that allow Amazon to execute as Amazon, right? And so for the first time, somebody actually sort of talked about how Amazon is able to do what, what Amazon is able to do. Which if you, if you think about it, it's actually a bit ridiculous. You have a low margin e-commerce business, right? That nearly went bankrupt multiple times. And then they expanded outwards and they, they kept entering new markets and they kept destroying everybody that they, 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 they were competing with. So I wrote a summary of the book, um, and then Colin reached out to me and said that, hey, uh, uh, you, you seem to understand what we're trying to get at. Um, you seem to have some business experience. Uh, you are technical, and we need that. Uh, and what I would you like to help us explicate chapter six of the book? And chapter six of the book is about the weekly business review, right? Um, turn it into a series of tutorials because we are now doing a bunch of consulting for Fortune 100 companies, and we want to teach them how to do the WBR. And I said, yes, sign me up because I want to learn, right? Like what the WBR is, as is described in the book, is that it, every Wednesday morning, uh, every executive that matters in, in Amazon sits down for a one hour meeting and they go through 400 to 500 metrics together every week, end to end from revenue, sorry, starting from traffic all the way to free cash flow, right? Um, that sounds a bit crazy, like 400 metrics in one hour. And I, you know, I asked Colin, like, was it actually one hour? I said, yeah, yeah, it's always one hour except for the holiday season where it runs over and becomes 90 minutes. Okay, um, and now I I have run I've I've operated in a few businesses like I but every business that I've been in has never been data driven. So even as a student, I was like, you know, I want to be data driven. It seems like there's this culture like if you want to be a good business operator, you have to be data driven. But we in computing, you would think that we are STEM and we are very technical, but actually we are never taught how to use data, right? Um, and so what I actually wanted to learn, uh, I mean, it was like a six month thing. I, I, I got to talk to him every week. And every week I would have questions after we talked about the work where I was like writing out like how to become, how to, how to implement the WDR. And he would answer my questions. Um, and uh, at the end of that entire six month thing, I, I started implementing the WDR. So this is what a WDR looks like. This is uh, Common Cult's WDR. We have about 60 metrics now, 40 something metrics now. Uh, each the graphs are all the same. This is a six twelve graph, six weeks, and then twelve months, and then you've got a whole bunch of um, numbers at the bottom. We'll, we'll talk. We can talk about this a bit more. But basically, I started doing WBR, and then I started talking to my friends, some of whom were running companies or they were in companies, and I tried to teach them how to do the WBR, and it completely failed. Like like I. They, they were a whole bunch of questions. People were like, oh, you know, like I can't really do the WBR because I don't have enough data. Data is only for people for, who have a lot of data, like big companies. If you're a small company, you can't do anything, right? Um, and that's wrong. Um, and it, it seemed clear to me that it was wrong. Oh, dear. I think we lost connection. <laughs> anyway, um, you can come in and debug if you want, but let me just continue. Uh, so at some point, at some point, uh, Recording in progress. <laughs> At some point, I had to take a step back and ask, like, why? Why is it so hard to try to teach the WBR to these people, right? Uh, and I, I eventually realized that over the course of the six months, what Colin had been teaching uh, was was not really so much. That there was the practices of the WBR, and don't get me wrong, they, they are there are quite a number of practices that you have to get right in order to do a WBR um, every week. Um, but there were a set of worldviews and philosophies that Colin had managed to communicate to me um, 
And I realized that I needed to talk about those worldviews before I can even talk about the WBR. So this is a talk about those ideas, right? Uh, which is actually the more important set of ideas. Because if I teach you the WBR, you're not going to be able to use it. You don't have a business to run, right? That you can start implementing this. And even if you join a company, there's no way that you can go and influence the CEO. And it has to be the CEO on down to implement this kind of thing. Um, so here are the goals of the talk, right? This talk would have succeeded if you walk away with a completely different way of looking at data. I guarantee you that all of you right now in your head have a certain way of thinking about data that will prevent you from doing this kind of, uh, from doing the WBA to do it, from doing as Amazon did, right? My goal is to remove that style of thinking about data. Uh, uh, and if I do that, then I think I would have succeeded, right? I will give you one data tool in the, in the course of this talk, but the tool is not the point. The tool is just to, it's, it's the oldest, uh, uh, proven, easiest method to get you to this kind of style of thinking, right? Be and the point is the worldview, because if you have the worldview, then you can lay on increasingly sophisticated tools and techniques later. Things that you learn in your data and analytics class or things when you go in, into a data science department and you go into industry, you, you look at it, you immediately know the right activity to, 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 to do uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at these kind of data tools, okay? So I'm, I'm going to give you something very, very simple that actually should be taught in secondary school. I have no idea why it isn't, and it's something that I wanted as a student. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with the, the most basic question. What is the purpose of data in business, right? Why become data-driven? And to answer this question, I'm gonna quote somebody who is actually the, the, the source of all of these ideas, right? Is this incredibly old statistician called W. Edwards Deming. Deming was responsible for the entire reindustrialization of Japan post-World War II, um, and he had a very clear answer to this, right? Um, so he's the father of statistical process control. The ideas that I'm going to give you uh, today are is from the body of statistical process control. You may not have heard of statistical process control, but you may have heard of uh, what's a quality engineering, um, TQC, Six Sigma, or lean manufacturing. Right? These are all uh, sort of successor ideas. So the ideas that I'm going to give you is actually for manufacturing. The purpose of data is knowledge. We shall define knowledge as theories or models that allow us to better predict the outcomes of our business actions. Okay, um, what does that mean? That means that you know, if you think about it, right? I'm gonna hire this software engineer, right? Or I'm gonna hire this salesperson. I am making a prediction that hiring this salesperson or this software engineer will make my business better in X, Y, Z ways, right? We are going to implement TDD in our software engineering team. I am making a prediction that TDD will lead to better outcomes for our software, whatever those outcomes may be, right? Um, so Deming was like, okay, there is, uh, uh, let, me, let me reverse a little bit first on. Um, most of us, when we go through school, we think that we are learning truths about the world, truths that are static, that never change, right? Deming argued that in business, when you are trying to get your business to work, right, there is no such thing as truth in business. There is only knowledge. What does that mean? Well, knowledge must have predictive validity. That means I believe that these set of actions, this marketing campaign, this sales technique will work for my business and will increase my sales. Right? I don't care about construct validity. Construct validity means that I, I make, I'm making a coherent argument to you. I don't, I don't freaking care whether your argument's coherent. I care in business that it works. Right? So why this is important is because if you go and read business history, any amount of business history, you will find the history of business littered with carcasses of businesses that believe that certain things were true, and then they, they continue to execute as if it were true, and then it died, like my laptop. <laughs> 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 okay. Now, knowledge is a more useful framing than business, right? <laughs> knowledge is a more useful framing than business, than truth, sorry, because things in business change. Deming actually argues a bit more than that. We're not going to go into it. It, it, it comes from epistemology. It's like in, in, in empirical domains, things change, and so therefore you need to be very conservative with, with what you think is true, okay? So data should help you get knowledge. That's the purpose of data. If something changes in your business environment, your metrics are supposed to tell you that, hey, like, some of your beliefs are no longer true. Um, sounds great, right? Okay, so everybody should use data. Why is this hard? It's hard, Deming argued, because of this. Look at this chart. If any of you have looked at an, an analytics dashboard before, right? Google Analytics or whatever, I don't know what kids use these days, Netlify, something. Um, you look at a dashboard, what does this graph tell you? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it going up? Is it going down? Should you be worried about the, the bottom 
points? Should you be happy about the spikes? The, if you are like me, right, when I was running, when I was running NUS Hackers, we had Google Analytics um, because we didn't know any better. And we would, I would open up the, the Google Analytics dashboards and I would be like, okay, cool. On a month-to-month -month basis, we get around 1,000 visitors. Should I be happy? Should I be sad? Like, what should I do, right? Um, we are not taught to deal with actual business metrics. Business metrics wiggle, right? And if I tell you that business metrics wiggle or, or real-world metrics wiggle, you say, of course they wiggle, right? Because if you weigh yourself on a weighing scale every day, you know that your weight will not be the same every day. But we are somehow... We somehow go through all of school and we expect our graphs to look as beautiful as these. These are graphs from the Financial Times. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the FT, FT, uh, Summon Color Background. Um, this is by a wonderful journalist called uh, John Byrne Murdoch. And he specializes in making beautiful graphs that you look at him and you're like, oh, I understand what's going on in the world, right? But business metrics don't look like that. Business metrics look like this. And if you think about this, right, like this particular metric is, is quite bad. Eh? In process inventory is a factory related metric. metric. Higher is worse. You have, in the last week alone, right, have you, uh, last month alone, there's a 47% increase uh, in, in, in your um, in process inventory, which is horrible. And you have to look at your management in the face and say that, oh, yeah, our in process metric uh, went up by 47%. And then they're like, what the fuck? Like, why? Right? Um, it's hard because it wiggles. And we, we are not taught how to deal with this wiggling. Okay, so if you don't believe, uh, I think most of you will buy that, that variation is real, that wiggling is real, right? Let's go through a couple of problems. And these are problems that um, either I have experienced or I'm sure some of you, if you have business experience or you work in a company before, you may have experienced as well. Some of them are actually taken from my friends who work in various companies uh, who have gone through this. So problem one, say that you think that your sales sucks. So you decide to change the process that you run, that you do your sales, right? So let's say you change the way that prospect calls are, are, are done. You change some sales training. This is the point of the change. Has it improved? You don't know. Right? Maybe it's improved, maybe it's not. Let's, let's wait a couple of weeks, right? Okay. We wait a couple of weeks already. Has it improved? I don't know. And if you don't know if it's improved, right, then I, I can you actually know anything about your business? Can you actually know like, oh, we changed this process. Or, I think it's kind of good. And like, you squint your eyes a bit. And then you say, I, no, no, no. And then, you know, three months later, you try another thing. This is a common story in, in just by every company that I've worked at, actually. Should I worry? This is the same story I told you already, 47% increase. But also, like, if it's high, if high is bad, right? Sorry, if high is bad, then, like, should you be worried about all oh, these spikes? Because in-process inventory is terrible because it's basically your cash is locked in, in inventory that you, you might not be able to move uh, if something goes wrong with your sales. Okay, so problem three, this is actually from a friend who worked at Stripe. Um, you run some microservices. Um, you have an SLA that says that your latency cannot be above a certain amount. Every week, your latency is piped into Slack. And then every, every couple of months, it's above the SLA. And then you get yelled at by your boss. What are you doing? Why did that? Explain, right? Uh, and this repeats again and again, month on month, right? In, in, in the company, in your microservices, your, this was the data infrastructure team. But anyway, um, the net result is, if you cannot deal with your wiggling, you cannot become data-driven, right? You, you will stop eventually looking at your charts and, you know, you are going to not use data to make your decisions because why should you, right? Like, you, nobody has ever, nobody has ever sat you down and said, look, here's how to look at business metrics. You are expected to know. And so everybody looks at percentage metrics and numbers and, and, and charts, but they don't actually do anything. And so what happens is eventually your boss starts using data as political wedges. Like you just get the data that I need to make my political arguments so I can get my promo. Okay, so the problem is variation. It's the key obstacle. You can't deal with variation, right? You cannot become data-driven. Or to put this another way, if you don't understand variation, right, then you are data illiterate. Um, and you cannot unsee this once you understand that this is the core sort of like uh, argument that that it's not only the core argument. I have never met someone who is data driven, who, who is a data driven executive, and who who has not figured out how to deal with variation. There are many ways. I'm going to show you one way. But the key idea is that like, if you can't deal with variation, you can't be data driven. What does understanding variation mean, right? So let's go back to the analogy of uh, stepping on a weighing scale. 
sometimes you step on a weighing scale and you're slightly heavier than yesterday. Maybe you slept late and there's water retention. Um, sometimes you're lighter, right? But uh, uh, you should know that if you eat a lot and you don't exercise at some point, right, your weight is going to go up. But because it wiggles, it's very hard for you to say, ah, today is the day that I have gained one kg, right? Especially if you're weighing every day. So the, the key thing that you want to be able to do is that some changes are meaningful and some changes are not, right? Um, just because a process is large or small in itself doesn't tell you anything. What you need to know is whether the, 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 the process change, the metric change historically compared to previous prior behavior is meaningful or not, okay? So we shall call, I'm going to define some terms because we're going to use them. We shall call changes that are meaningful exceptional or special variation. We shall call changes that are not meaningful routine variation. Okay? We need some way to find to tell the difference. And we want to be sure. We want to be sure. So there are methods that people use to try to tell whether or not a change is meaningful. Moving average is one. But are you sure? Are you sure that there's a change? Right? What if you're not sure and then you take action and you, you believe that this is true and then you think that this is knowledge and then you go forward and make more changes based on faulty knowledge? If you're not sure, right, that can, can buy you, can like cost you months. Um, and then like linear trends are also another way that people try to do this. Uh, but the problem with linear trends is that if you remove the first data point and the last data point, you get a completely different linear trend. Okay, at this point, a lot of people that I tell this to, I understand, it's very obvious, variation is a problem, so what? And why is being sure so important? Let me paint you a picture of what happens when you actually can tell when there's a change. Right? So this is a real world story. This is, a, this is like a stylized series of true events that happened to us when we started putting these ideas to practice. Us, me and my team, I write a blog called Common Cog. Uh, we, we run a weekly business review every Wednesday night. Um, as far as I can tell, this, this stylized uh, 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 series of events um, happens, I, I think I can guarantee certain points in this story that I'm about to tell you will happen again and again when every, when, whenever you go down this journey, even if you do not use the tools that I'm talking about. So I, let's say I give you a magical tool to help you do this. I'm not going to tell you what the tool is yet. Right? The tool gives you the power to tell when a metric has actually changed. If you have that power, you start using it. Right? What might this do for you? Okay, so here's what you experience. Let's say you use the tool on a metric you care about, like website uniques. You care about the traffic that comes to your website. Right? You start running experiments. Right? Um, and you, maybe you post to LinkedIn or Twitter, or you, maybe you start doing TikTok. Uh, maybe you post more controversial essays. What's going to happen is that none of it will work. Your tool will stay silent and say nothing changed. Variation is still wiggling. It's happily wiggling up and down every week. Nothing, there's nothing meaningful that has changed. Right? At some point, you're going to realize that, hey, maybe what we think works doesn't actually work. Right? And this is actually a very important point. Everybody I know who becomes data-driven, th there is a like a come-to-Jesus moment that basically they're like, oh, actually, just running my business or running my process or running my team based on fuels along, alone might not be good enough. At some point, if you keep doing this and you're disciplined, one of two things will happen. Right? Either you successfully make a change and experiment and then the tool screams at you, something has changed. Or... Out of nowhere, something that you did not expect, no change that you made, you know, something happens, and then the 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 metric, the tool screams that you something has changed, and then you go out and investigate. Okay, you discover, and then you go out and investigate. You discover something that actually moves your metric, right? You discover a control factor. So, uh, okay, this is like a, a bunch of screenshots from uh, a thing that we discovered as we were running this. But uh, let me tell you a story. When we first created Friday Hacks, right? Uh, people did not turn up for Friday Hacks. And part of the reason was because uh, originally our idea for Friday Hacks was everybody would come together and hack. And uh, the problem with that is that students at NUS back then, um, maybe now, I don't know, uh, did not really care about uh, hacking. They cared about getting good grades and then playing World Warcraft or playing Star whatever. Starcraft, I think Starcraft 2 had already come out at the time, and then going home, right? So we decided, let's give people free pizza. And then, ah, exceptional variation. Like, more people turn up, right? Maybe we should keep giving free pizza, right? Um, but the problem was, because we didn't have any data tools, we did it by feel. I did it by feel. We were like, I think, I think it works. Uh, and then we had to try. But then, like, the after the midterm week, for two weeks, the attendance dropped. 
right? And then we had to wait, uh, I think, two years before we could like, ah, oh, actually, a yeah, pizza works. Pizza really does increase uh, uh, attendance permanently. It's like exceptional variation to a new process behavior, right? But it took us two years, two, sorry, not two years, one year, one full semester, and maybe it took us one and a half years before we realized that uh, every after midterm exam, the, the, the two Friday hacks after midterm exam, nobody will attend, right? Uh, because there's exams, right? And so we've learned to always keep a, the talk in our back pocket. Uh, basically, Sean will come out and give a LaTeX talk, which will be barely attended, but it's fine. <laughs> um, or, 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 and then eventually we learn, eventually we learn that if you do project intern, a lot of students want to know how to get become, you know, how to get a tech internship. So if you do that right after the midterm exams, right, people will turn up even though they have exams, right? But we had to do a lot of trial and error. We had to do this over the course of three or four years, right? We didn't really have knowledge. The knowledge was very hard worn, worn and it took a long time, right? Now, if you have data, you can you can do this a lot faster. You can like, oh, exceptional variation. Okay, we know it works. Let's move on to the next experiment. We have built knowledge. We know we have we know things that have predictive power. If got pizza, more people will come. Right? I don't know why you have bubble tea, but I'm sure there's some equivalent <laughs> logic. <laughs> Maybe people are falling asleep during the talks. Um, okay, so what happened uh, in October last year? Uh, 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 so I, the metrics that I care about is revenue. I care about traffic a bit, but I care actually about revenue and I care about. Um, I care about new subscribers, right? New email subscribers. So uh, we've been doing various things, experimenting, trying to tweet more, trying to post on LinkedIn more, not getting on TikTok. I, I, I'm not great at TikTok, I'm sure. Um, and then at some point, one of these essays uh, was, one of the essays that I wrote was linked to uh, by investing Substack um, with 2,000 subscribers. And then we saw exceptional variation in all metrics, like a whole bunch of metrics suddenly, right? Uh, and the most important thing to me was that uh, we saw exceptional variation in uh, new email subscribers, which is what I cared about. Um, so uh, you see the highlight here is the overall conclusion. This gives us additional evidence that newsletter ads work, but we have to have, because we have actual numbers now, right? Exceptional variation. So as a result, we kicked off like a project to try to figure out like what kinds of newsletters would work uh, uh, because you can't just advertise on like a mummy newsletter, right? Like I, I don't write parenting advice. I write about business. So we need to figure out like what set of properties are best. We, we need knowledge. We need to figure out what set of properties are best indicative of like high traffic, high conversion to newsletter subscriber, and then hopefully conversion later to customer. Okay. Um, at this point, if you, once you have that first success, uh, you realize, oh, actually, if I've, I've discovered a control factor, I can keep doing it. If I keep, can keep doing it, I can start tracking it as a metric. And if I can start tra tracking it as a metric, right, right, I can put it on my WBR and I can incentivize it. I can tie people's promotions to it. And congratulations, you discovered something that Amazon calls controllable input metrics. So you have an output metric, you have a controllable input metric. Your job is to find more and more controllable input metrics. So you start to think, oh, it worked for traffic. What else can we use this for? Let's use this for revenue. And then the same thing happens. You, for months, you try random things, it doesn't work. And then suddenly you find something that works and you're like, holy shit, it works. Let's do more of it. And then your revenue goes up, right? Uh, and then you realize that this approach can be applied to everything in your business. You want to use it for hiring? Yes, you can. You want to do it for sales? Yes, you can. You want to improve user onboarding and increase signups by giving your engineers access to the metrics and asking them to come up with experiments, right? You can do the same thing. And that's what Amazon did in the early days, right? This in the 1990s. All because you can tell that something has changed. Now, I, we just mentioned controllable input metrics in a, uh, uh, before this. And usually when Colin teaches like his Fortune 100 clients, right, he would say like, oh, this is what a controllable input metric is. This is what an output metric is. And most companies, most executives don't actually know what controllable input metrics exist for the output metrics they care about, right? And so he has to teach them, hey, like you have to go and investigate and find out. And the way you investigate and find out is that you have to guess. He, sorry, he hated when I said the word guess. He was like, these are business people who are very successful. They have intuitions and judgments that we should trust. They can usually make a good, um, okay, I finally used the word guess on what controllable input metric works. But the point is that you need to confirm with data, with reality, right? So what have I just described to you? I've just described to you that this is a trial and error process where you have an output metric you care about. I give you a data tool that tells you when things have changed successfully, and you use it to search out each individual controllable info metric. Okay? 
how do you, and so uh, I, I'm I'm going to give you just three ideas first, and then we're going to return to it at the end of the talk. Um, you don't. How do you experiment to f find out the controllable info metrics, right? I, I don't. I don't. Deming didn't leave you hang, hanging. Deming taught these people that that he that um, came for his seminars. Uh, three big ideas, right? One is the PDSA cycle. The PDSA cycle is just a fancy term for something that all of us know, which is how to do trial and error. How do you do trial and error? You make a plan. You do the plan, you stop to think about what you've learned after you've executed the plan, and then you take the next iteration of the cycle, incorporating what you've learned, right? But most businesses, they act this way, they, they plan, they do, they never stop and study. They just plan do, and then we go to the next one. Plan do, and then we they go to the next one, right? And then like just about every company that I've been in is like, oh, fire, and then oh, I think it's good. <laughs> okay, next plan. And then like you're like, do you learn anything from it, right? Do you increase your knowledge? Number, the second the second thing that he taught, again, common sense, right? If you want to improve something, you need to ask three questions. What do you want to accomplish? How will you accomplish it? How would you know you've accomplished it? And actually, the hard one is the third question. And then the third thing that he gave was this magical tool, which we'll talk about in a moment, right? Now, before we, I talk about the tool, uh, uh, I, I just want to point out that there is a trick here. The tool is not the point. The worldview, this attitude is the point, right? This is what the pursuit of knowledge looks like. And the result of data is that you have a causal model of your business in your head that you can update as things, like in, as your macro environment changes, as things change. Yeah, well, as things change. Um, okay, this next bit, actually, it's quite important that I have the visuals for this next bit. Um, most people, when you, when I give you a dashboard, including myself, right? There is a default way that you think about data. I call it the optimization worldview. Most people will look at a number and think, how can I make this number go up? Or if they are slightly experienced, they will take a step back and go like, oh, um, this number seems like it's a number on some kind of funnel, right? Uh, what are the funnel steps? This is probably a conversion percentage from the previous step to the current step. I want to make that conversion percentage go up. And the, the, the result of this attitude is, oh, in order to be data-driven, I'm just going to set a big, hairy, audacious goal. I, I don't know how you're going to accomplish it, but like your promotion depends on a 12% increase in sales next quarter. You better go figure out a way to do it. right? Contrast this to the attitude that I've just presented to you. right? Let's call it the process control worldview, because this is what the Amazonians use. right? Um, Colin used to say, okay, hiring is a problem. Let's subject it to process control. Put it on the WPR. Right? The process control worldview is like this. Everything in your business is a process. You can decompose, your business itself is a process, you can decompose it into multiple small processes. Your job is to figure out what are the control factors for each process. And you will do this by I, because I can give you a tool that will tell you when you've successfully changed the metric that you're trying to improve, right? And then you just iterate to find the control factors or the causal factors that cause that metric to go up. This is a very different worldview. And I would say that like, Every data-driven person that you meet, uh, regardless of where it is, whether it's Facebook growth team, uh, Pinterest growth team, they have this worldview. They might not use this language. They might get to this through different means, but the underlying worldview is always the same. It is this, not this. And if somebody you ever meet, and you, I guarantee you, you will have bosses that would think like this, you basically should just know that nobody has set them down to teach them how to actually use data in a business context. Okay, let's talk about the tool. The tool is something called a process behavior chart. It is 90 years old. It can be calculated by hand and plotted on graph paper. It was designed to be used uh, by World War II engineers. Um, so it was created in 1924. Over the years, there have been many names. It's called the Schuhart chart or the control chart. It was invented by Walter Schuhart in 1924. It was popularized by Deming in 1941 or two. I can't remember. Under the ordnance department, Deming taught around 2,000 people at Stanford, who then went on to various factories around the U.S., uh, who then implemented it across the, uh, the U.S. for the war effort, right? And then they, they, they won the war, and then Deming was assigned to go to Japan, which was completely bombed out. People were starving, and he called all the CEOs of the entire Japanese industrial base. I think at one point he had like 70 or 80% of all the CEOs of all the Japanese industrial companies in one room. He said, Look, I will teach you how to rebuild your industrial base using American methods that was used to defeat you, right? Uh, here is, here's what we're going to do. It's called statistical process control, but the Japanese called it quality control. 
right, or the military quality control, which we now call military control, uh, sorry, quality control, right? And as a result of this process of trial and error using data, you got the Toyota production system. Right, which which some of you might recognize because if you've used lean, if you've heard of lean software development or lean manufacturing, right, all of these the progenitor ideas is from this set of ideas. Okay, how does it work? The simplest PBC is the XML chart. We're going to talk about the XML chart uh, only. Uh, there are other PBCs, right? Um, it is the best suited for non-manufacturing use cases. It is itself comparative, comparatively new. Um, in the sense that like the technique that it uses to estimate tree sigma is from 1941 by von Neumann. Uh, it was first created in 1950, but it was not widely used, and it was only popularized by Wheeler, Donald Wheeler in 1982. Uh, this is what it looks like, okay? Um, and here is how it works. So uh, on the left is something called an X chart, which is just your, your the variable that you care about, the metric you care about called an X, well, we call it X, so X chart. And then the, the, the one on the right is the moving range chart or the MR chart, which basically tracks the successive values, differences. Uh, it's no negative values, but successive differences between each uh, point. And then you calculate, uh, it's literally addition and multiplication. Uh, you, you get an estimate of uh, three sigma around an average line. Right? And then the rule is very simple. If you've got numbers running between the two average lines, this is routine variation. You don't have to care. You don't have to worry. You shouldn't investigate any point. This is just normal variation. Now the question is like, how do you know that something has changed, right? So XML charts have three signals to detect exceptional variation. Um, actually, there were many signals, and the original sort of, I think the, the initial standardization is the Western Electric rules. Western Elec so the, the, original XML ch the original process control chart was created for phone manufacturing under Bell Labs uh, under AT&T, right? Uh, and these are four rules, but we don't have to look at them. Uh, I will tell you about the three simplest rules because Wheeler sort of simplified it in the 90s. The first rule is, if you see a point outside the limit lines, investigate on either the X plot or the MR plot, okay? Rule number two is, if you see three, three points in a row closer to the limit line than a center line, you should investigate. This is a moderate source of exceptional variation, right? Uh, it's, it's a process shift in the range of 1.5 to 2.5 sigma. Um, something weird is going on, but it's not as strong as the previous uh, signal. So in this case, you've got three in a row. Uh, this is closer to the average line, but these two are closer to the limit line. This is the middle point, right? And then the last rule is runs of eight, which is um, if eight in a row uh, on either side of the average line, that's a signal you should investigate. It's a weak signal. Also, it's a signal that the process behavior has permanently changed. So you should actually cut here and recalculate the limit lines. Right? Why does this work? So the technical explanation is that uh, process behavior charts are a test of homogeneity. Right? Uh, it asks the question, is the data in this time series independent and identically distributed? The loose, sloppy uh, explanation is that we can say that when, a, when your weight wiggles, right, it's a random process, and we are sampling from one probability distribution. right? Um, the question we are asking is, is there more than one probability distribution in the wiggling that we are seeing? right? So if, if something weird, uh, you can sort of think of the homogeneity test as like, given a collection of data that we've taken from these balls, right? Did we take from one probability distribution or did we take from multiple, right? Um, if something unexpected happens in your process, if you're looking at website traffic and suddenly Justin Bieber links to you, although why that would happen, I don't know, um, then there's probably another source of, uh, uh, it's a different probability distribution, right? Because something else has linked to you, something else is going on. If you successfully change a process, then after that point, right, the variation should be different from the point before, in which case the process behavior chart will tell you, ah, you have more than one probability distribution uh, that, that in, your, in your set of data, therefore you know that a change has happened, right? So it's a really simple tool. It's really dumb, right? It's so bloody, like, it's, you don't even have to have good math. This was taught to factory workers in bomb out World War II with not much education. And from there, by pure trial and error, purely because they can good, get good feedback, they could create and invent the Toyota production system, right? Okay, a few more rules, a few more concepts. If a process only shows routine variation, we shall call it a predictable process. It's predictable because you don't actually know which point uh, will appear next, but you know that it will appear between these two lines. So it has predictability, right? Um, and then a process that shows routine and exceptional variation, we shall call it an unpredictable process because uh, we don't actually know 
uh, what's going to happen next because there's like some other thing that's going on, right? So we can't tell when the next point will be. Um, so we can call this signal versus noise, right? If it's routine variation, that's good. It's just noise. We don't have to investigate any of the points, but it's up or down. If if there is exceptional variation while the tree's rules are triggered, there is signal and noise. Um, so how do you improve your process? If a process is unpredictable, investigate. Right, your job. Every signal is an opportunity to gain knowledge. If it's something bad that's happening, you should ask yourself, "Oh, how can we redesign our process so that that bad thing doesn't happen again?" If it's something good, like my newsletter ad, for example, right? How can we go and systematically try to get more newsletters to link to my website, right? And then you go and then you try PDSA. You try asking the three questions, right? Um, if the process is predictable, then it's already performing as well as it can, right? You don't need to investigate anything. You need to completely rethink the process. Either invest in new technology, rewrite your code, uh, change the people you're hiring, change the training of the people you're hiring, something. Okay, so uh, how to improve? The... When, when, we, when we learn to walk, we learn to walk through trial and error, right? Um, when you climb a tree and you fall off a tree, you immediately learn, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should climb the tree slightly differently, right? For some reason, when it comes to organizations, we have to remind ourselves that, hey, you need to do, and then you need to stop and think about, like, what have we learned from the thing that we've done, right? So this is why Deming sort of talked about, hey, you need to execute trial and error using a PDSA <coughs> cycle. Right? You need to say what you plan to do, pre-register what you expect to happen. You need to do, you need to study, you need to act. Okay. Um, that means you to say that you need to answer three questions. What do you want to accomplish? How would you accomplish it? How would you know you've accomplished it? Most people struggle with the third question. Right? When we, when we started using pizza in, in, in NUS Hackers Friday Hacks, we did it by feel. <laughs> It was quite bad, but eventually we could get it to work, right? It just took a very long time. Um, and in fact, one of the things, when looking back on my experiences, the execution that we had in NUS Hackers was much better than any of the businesses that I've run, right? And, and bear in mind that I built two businesses uh, on the order of seven figures in terms of like increasing profit. But NUS Hackers had much better knowledge building because at the end of every semester, we will stop, we will have a dinner, and we will say, what worked? But in business, huh, we would just, my boss would say, oh, uh, Cedric, I think we should go after this market. Okay. And then we go after that market, and we spend a lot of money, and we really suffer, and the customers yell at us, and then the next, uh, next year, right? Okay, Cedric, we just go after that market. And yeah, you know, over time, it was like, a, when I left the company, it was like from zero to $4.5 million. But did we actually learn anything? I'm not sure. And we could have executed much better if we had stopped for a while and said, okay, what did we learn from the execution cycle, right? You can't just blindly do. Okay, how do you improve given these two things? You can know that these two things have, you have worked when either you reduce the variation, right? Or you shift the entire band of variation up and down, right? And usually um, uh, in, in classical continuous improvement, you are recommended to reduce the variation first before you shift the band up and down because there is cost to variation it's harder to plan around a, a, a wide, a wide variance cycle. Um, secondly, it is easier to see when you've improved if the, the variance is tight, right? It's easier to see that you shifted the mean. Now, my example earlier, right, of my friend who worked in data infrastructure and got yelled at every time he went above the SLA, he should have put it on a process behavior chart and said that, hey, you know, our process behavior is expected to be between 238 milliseconds and 132 milliseconds, right? Our SLA is set as 200. Does this make sense? Maybe we should just increase the SLA. Maybe it doesn't matter. Or maybe it does matter, in which case, maybe we should be fundamentally rethinking the process, re-architating the process so that we can try to shift the variation to be lower than the SLA, right? But there's no such argument whatsoever. His manager was just, every time it was above bad SLA, what happened, huh? What happened? You better go figure it out. Huh? Later, you don't meet your OKRs, you can't get promo, right? Which is dumb because this is routine variation. The process is expected to be behave like this. You, it's already be behaving as there's nothing weird going on, right? Okay. Let's take a step back. The title of this talk and the point of this talk is how to actually become data driven, right? What have I shown you? Uh, the point of the talk is not the tool. We can talk more about the tool if you want, but it's not the tool. Um, the point of the talk is the worldview, right? It's process control, not optimization. 
you are trying to seek knowledge. Deming used to say that management is prediction. You can't run a company well or a software team well or anything if you are not able to predict reliably the outcomes of your actions. Because why would you do certain things if you don't believe that it will work, right? So he used to say management is prediction. Not, and again, the definition of knowledge is knowledge is theories or models that allow you to better predict the outcomes of your business actions. Therefore, the purpose of data is knowledge, right? And therefore, one definition of operational excellence or being good at running businesses, running things, is that you just have to pursue knowledge in everything that you do, right? Now, there are many ways to knowledge. Some of you, when I was a student, um, we the hot thing in the tech industry was A-B testing, right? Um, and it's been 10 years. We know that, yes, everybody believes that A-B testing is the best way to get knowledge because you're holding a control group and then you're holding an intervention group and you're saying that, oh, actually, this set of users exposed to this feature will perform better than this set of users, right? Um, but we also know that it has not taken off in, the, in most of the tech industry. And the reason is because, A, there's statistical sophistication. You need to be able to know that it's a st statistically significant result. And B, the harness to set up an A-B test is actually quite uh, involved. You need political buy-in to be able to invest engineering uh, resources to build up the A-B testing harness so that PMs and engineers can all run it, right? So A-B testing is a form of knowledge. It's a way to get to knowledge. But I have never worked in a company with strong A-B testing. If you if you work in Facebook, you probably have uh, Meta now. You probably have exposure to their A/B testing harness and their A/B testing framework. Um, but I was not lucky enough to do that. It's also possible to gain knowledge from talking to customers. And in fact, you will often hear startup founders say, "It's not useful to look at metrics. Why? Because they have never been taught. They're data illiterate. So therefore, the only way to get knowledge is to talk to the customer and figure out what the customer wants. This is not wrong, right? It is not wrong, but it's as if you're trying." It's like you're, you're walking into a, 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 you're bringing a knife into a gunfight, right? What for you, you use a knife when you can also use a gun, right? There are more ways of getting knowledge than just A-B testing, which is very expensive, very hard to do, or customer interviews. So the reason why I've talked to you about process behavior charts today is because I guarantee all of you will be looking at metrics. At some point in your life, you will look at some analytics chart. And at some point, you'll be like, so what? Like, is this good or bad, right? And process behavior charts are like this really simple tool that has somehow been lost to time, stuck in manufacturing and, and logistics. Um, and, and we should be using them because it allows us to gain knowledge when we're looking at numbers, right? So most companies don't pursue knowledge. Um, Deming used to say that they run their businesses on superstition. Crystal Vijaya, which is, uh, who was the ex-head of growth at Gojek, like to say they have a lot of fan theories, right? Like you think that, oh, maybe if I do this, then I will get good profits. Or maybe if I do that, then I will get good results. Now that sounds very like, oh yeah, business is very stupid. But if you think about it, right, our domain of software, right, we don't pursue knowledge as well. As a discipline, software engineering has many best practices, right? We have TDD, we have uh, full CICD, uh, we have agile, we have extreme programming. If all of these practices that people say, oh, very good, like will result in lower bucks, better test coverage means higher quality software. CI, CD, very good, like great productivity, small batches, must use version control. But how do you know, right? Now, I'm not saying that these things don't work. I bet that they do work. But I also bet that they will learn through pizza. Oh, I think it will, oh, I think uh, in three or four years, right? And then like, just because people say that they think that our software elders says that, that it works, right? Doesn't mean it might work for our company, in our context, in our industry, you know, right? You should pursue knowledge, which means you need to ask the three questions, right? So Deming would say, and actually I've, I've, over the years, I've talked to a lot of software engineers and very often if there's a process change in the software development team, right? The, what will happen is that the, the senior engineers will go off into a corner like Moses receiving receiving the tablets from heaven, right? Discuss on like how to do the process change. Come down and go like, oh, we're all doing test driven TDD right now. We're all doing test driven development now. Why? Because it's good. Because it's best practice. But then, whenever in manufacturing, right, fifty years ago, a hundred, uh, sixty, seventy years ago, whenever a line engineer would say, oh, I want to do this process change, right? Deming would say like, how would you know? His favorite question was, how would you know? And if, if the line engineer said, oh, from experience, then Deming will say, now you've revealed yourself. You're superstitious, right? You don't actually know. So the reason Deming taught the, the reason Deming taught the process control chart, right? Which we know with the XML chart that I've showed you is because it's an answer to the third question. How would you know that the change you've done has actually worked, right? So the typical defense 
when I was a student, there was a very famous talk called Bits of Knowledge by Greg Wilson. And in, in that talk, he argued that software is pre-scientific, just like how medicine used to be pre-scientific. We would try random shit to see like if people, oh, die, oh, oh wow, <laughs> right? And then, and, then, and then medicine received randomized controlled trials, which is this experimental approach of two subject studies, right? Control group and intervention group. And then they got knowledge. And then he argued, oh, but software, we cannot do RCT, so we are forever do. And I believed him. But actually, you know, if you think about it, right, what Deming was grappling with as a statistician in the war effort, in the build-up of the World War II with this quality problem, right, is the same thing. You can't have, you can't necessarily do RCTs because they're too expensive and they take too long, right? Uh, so if you think about it, right, manufacturers can't do RCTs. They can't build shared knowledge through industry-wide RCTs. And so what Deming gave you, actually, is these three ideas, huh? the PDSA loop, the three questions of continuous improvement, and the XML chart, is they gave you a way to do N equals one studies, trial and error, right? How do you do rigorous trial and error? Because you don't actually care if you're a single business or a single person, what works for another person. So the problem with RCTs is that yes, you get some knowledge, but just because an, an SSRI, a, a, a drug works for someone, right? Doesn't mean that it might work for you, you know? Doctors know this, that's why they always give you a small dose to say, does it work or not? Because they know that at a population level it works, but they don't know for you it works. So there is a problem, there is one sort of like generalization problem. We know that it generally works, we don't know if it works for you, but you as a human being, you don't care about whether it works for the population, right? You just care like, does it not kill me? Does it work for me? Do I get less depressed? Does Panadol work for my fever, right? When you are trying to improve your software development skills, or you're trying to lose weight, or you're trying to improve your, your aerobic fitness, or you're trying to gain muscle, you have the same thing. Sure, there's a whole body of knowledge out there about what might work for the general human being. But what you care about is what works for you, right? And so you need a rigorous way of improving yourself. And so how do you improve yourself? Well, you do trial and error, PDSA, right? And then you ask yourself, what do I want to accomplish? How will I accomplish it? And how would I know I've accomplished it? And the XML chart gives you a shot and looking at a stream of data from your weight or your muscle mass or your, uh, what do you call it, your oxygen, uh, uh, VO2 max levels and say, okay, it's worked. This intervention has worked for me. This kind of exercise works for me, right? So you don't really care about what works generally. You care about what's for you. Um, the point is, the point that I'm just trying to make here is that, yes, this is the path to becoming data-driven, but actually what Deming has given all of us is a way to do rigorous single subject studies. Okay, I, we're running out of time, so I'll just like spin over this. Thank you. Um, I've got three last things. So uh, since uh, summer last year, uh, Hanben over here, uh, he was a first year student and he did an internship with me and we built a tool at, which is live at zermay.com now. It took so long, I'm so sorry. We iterated it on it a lot. That makes it trivial for you to generate basic XML charts. And eventually the website will contain a uh, Everything you need to know about the technique, the statistics, um, it's actually spread across multiple books and multiple papers, and we don't want you to be able to, we don't want you to do what we had to do, which is to chase down. Uh, I also want to call out Sam, Sam, Wave. Sam is from manufacturing, uh, and he actually taught me a lot of these techniques as I was struggling with them. A big question that we wanted to know was why it hasn't spread outside of manufacturing, right? And uh, <sighs> It's a bit long, the answer, but uh, we will eventually write a blog post about it. So please sign up for the, there's a free email course as well on the website, which tells you how to use these tools. Um, I'm looking for writing interns. Probably none of you are interested because I know programmers don't like to write. Uh, but if you have other friends in other faculties, there is a list of jobs here. Uh, and finally, just for NUS hackers, because you are the NUS hackers, um, you are my people. Uh, if you send me an email address before Sunday, uh, I will give you a free Common Cloud membership, which is a membership to my blog, and uh, which typically costs two hundred fifty US dollars a year. Not that expensive, but, um, but I would gladly give you access to this, uh, and then you can go read all of. Like, you can sort of see me going through the like a one and a half year process of like, how does this work? How, uh, oh, and then like I, I write as I learn, and then. It started working and I started realizing, oh, this is how I explain things. Okay, sorry. <sighs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, so stupid. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, the basic answer is you get, you know, the moving range, which is the difference between successive values, right? You take the average of that you multiply it by a constant, a magical constant, 
and then you add that to the average of the X chart is and you the, get the upper. Is the magical constant like universal or? The magical constant is universal. And it, it's, it was, it's a von Neumann, the von Neumann paper established like why the magical constant works. It's basically there's a relationship between, there's a relationship between the successive, the, the average of the successive differences with the, um, with standard deviation, yeah. right? And if you multiply by three by that constant, okay. yeah, then you get yeah, that. Yeah, and, and then you are you are estimating the three sigma value because you're not sure if the data that you're looking at is from one distribution or multiple. So you cannot use the, the normal standard deviation calculation right. because that will create like the bounds that are too, too wide. It's so stupid that like, you can yeah. use paper and pencil. <laughs> uh, the error rate for most distributions is 3%. False alarm, sorry, false alarm rate. Um, if you use a, if, if there are, it's a W-shaped distribution, or uh, M-shaped distribution, um, it is an 11% uh, false alarm rate. So, XMR charts are not useful for combinations of processes, right? So, we used to uh, use it on net new uh, subscribers, and then we decomposed it to new subscribers and churn subscribers, and then we realized that actually there's no signal at all. Right. So, there's also like the ridiculous yeah, you're assuming that it's some kind so of probability distribution. You don't really know the shape, and you don't really care because the point is to not yeah. care, right? Yeah. Yes. So uh, there are some actions that may bring short-term benefits, but in long term, it's the criminal. Yes. If you follow this data driven path, would it lead to the suspicious there was before? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you need to use judgment when using these tools. So part of the WBR process, right, is you have control controllable infometrics, but then you have to sort of say to yourself, like, how long would it take for the change in the output metric to show up given that I've driven the controllable infometrics? The craziest example of this that I know is uh, when they launched Amazon Prime, everybody knew that it would bankrupt the company. Jeff Bezos said, let's just launch it anyway because we will figure out a way to bring down costs. And so, of course, cost for Prime and the amount of cash left, left in the bank before they ran out of bankrupt was on the WBR subjected to process control. And every week, they were iterating to figure out ways to bring that variation down of like cost, right? Um, and it took them... And when they launched, Colin said there were three, three metrics they tracked. Number of items for order, number of orders per year, number of items per year. And the bet was that Prime would allow the uh, number, all of these metrics to go up, right? But they were willing to wait a very long time. How long? I asked that. I asked Colin. He said, well, you have to remember that at the time, 2004, 2005, even Amazon's most avid customers only hired, uh, only, only bought things on Amazon three or four times a year. So we were willing to wait years, right? And so they waited two years before they saw a change in that metric. So this is, it's, yes, you, you can be data-driven, but that doesn't excuse you or remove your ability to have business judgment and to have gumption, right? So that's, but I mean, it's a lot better than just vibes. Oh, I think this works. Okay. Next. Next question. Any questions? Or pizza? Not, uh, oh, yes. Oh. Uh, so I think in one of the examples, you mentioned like, you even though you haven't made any change. Yes. Yes. So how do you actually like, work that to find out the change that I think that, um, Yes. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, sometime in April last year, uh, newsletter performance for every Substack in the world, I mean, okay, that I can have checked. I've asked my friends, I've asked other creators, I've asked other writers online. Uh, it fell off a cliff. Sub newsletter growth is no longer the same process as it was uh, before April, March, April, sometime between March and April last year. We don't know why. We can guess. It could be the end of ZERP. It could be the end of the pandemic. Maybe there was like some kind of pandemic effect. Uh, I don't know. So you, you don't actually know, but you can be honest with yourself. Hey, these are a bunch of hypotheses of like what's going on. And then we, 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 we'll see through time whether or not it's true or not. And everything that you learn, right? One, one of the things that I didn't say, but this should be quite obvious to you if you're a scientific. Actually, it wasn't obvious to me, so Sean had to point it out to me. Um, when you find a result, right, from some data, right, you need to run a new experiment to figure out whether it is a real causal relationship. Because just because you see a correlation doesn't mean that it's causal, right? You always have to run a new experiment. 